listen, we'll get we'll get rolling. And uh, I know Matt is just running a few minutes behind um, who, but he'll be joining us in, in just a few seconds. Um, I'll go ahead and, and get get us started by introducing um, Brian. And uh, Brian McCormick is calling us from Estonia, where it's 830 in the morning on on Monday. And um, hopefully, Brian, you got a good night's rest last night. Hopefully you were able to, you know, be prepared for this, you know, deep conversation <laughs> we're going to have. <laughs> um, listen, I've known Brian for, for what is it, probably now for almost 15 years, Brian, like 20, 2007, I think it was when we first met. Um, yeah, somewhere, somewhere in that range. Um, so look, Brian, Brian is a, Brian McCormick, PhD right now. He is a, uh, the head coach of the under 18, under 16 boys teams at Tartu University in Estonia. Um, he's also a coach developer there. Um, Brian uh, was before this at Broward College uh, in Florida, which is a division one junior college, he coached the women's team there. Um, he has a PhD in exercise and sports science. I got that wrong in our advert. Um, he's, uh, it's not motor learning, but um, interestingly, we'll ask him about the hip turn a little bit later, which, which was the focus of his um, dissertation. Uh, some really interesting stuff on balance and movement in, in basketball uh, and defensive um, um, uh, play. And I think it's really important for player development. Um, I met Brian when I started coaching and I'll, I'll kind of like give this little bit of uh, background before Brian says anything about himself. But, you know, I came across Brian uh, when I sort of decided, I think that I wanted to be a coach uh, and, and that was around 2006, 2007. And the first, I don't even know how I came across your stuff, but crossover was the first book that I came across and, and, it, and it, it, it got me initially just right away. Um, the thing about that's unique about Brian is, is he loves writing about his philosophies. Um, and so there is no shortage of text that's available online for people to read. I think it's cause you, have, did you get your undergrad in English, Brian? Is that, is that right? Your original? Yeah. Literature, American literature. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Brian's first degree um, was from from UCLA, right? Correct. Yeah, was in, in American literature. And so Brian loves writing um, and he's combined that love of writing with his love of coaching and his understanding of, of, of learning. Um, but I met him after reading this book and this book was, was really profound for me. I was just getting started in coaching. I wasn't sure where it was gonna go. I knew I liked player development and Brian uh, introduced me to any number of topics, including growth mindset. I don't think I would have come across growth mindset had it not been for, for your work, Brian. So there was a lot of really thought provoking, provocative stuff that Brian was doing at the time um, and is still doing to this day. And I think what I, what I have always admired about Brian and respected about Brian as we've kind of gone on the last, you know, 14, 15 years was that, you know, he always, sought the truth and and he he believed in research and he believed in uh, experimentation and he always wanted to push the envelope in ways that were good for kids um and good for quality basketball and good for you know youth youth development and player development and so i think we'll hear that a lot as we go brian do you want to maybe for the uh for those who don't know you uh just share a little bit about yourself before we we get into this um you know meaty conversation about player development and, and coaching yeah, sure. Thank you very much for that, Vinny. Um, you know, I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think you covered most of it. You know, I've coached different places, you know. Um, uh, I guess if we met in 2007, then I was, it was right after um, I'd coached at, um, coached in Ireland. Um, and before that, I'd coached in Sweden. And, you know, I mean, I, I coached all the way through college at UCLA coaching, you know, I started with Special Olympics and then I started coaching um, fifth and sixth grade CYO, girls volleyball and basketball. And then I got into AAU and then into high school. And then as soon as I graduated, I went as a, you know, assistant coach, you know, at college level. So, um, you know, I kind of started, uh, you know, with basically beginners, you know, and, and moved up kind of every year um, you know, as some coaches do, especially outside of the U S but, um, and then, you know, I've had opportunities to coach overseas in, in a couple different places now, um, you know, Sweden, Ireland, Denmark, and, and now in Estonia. And so, um, and then because of that, and because of having, you know, the book and the books and, and having coached overseas and stuff, I've done clinics in a lot of different places, 
um, which has afforded me the opportunity to meet a lot of different coaches and, and continue to, I guess, be challenged in the way that I see the game and then, um, you know, kind of put my ideas onto the new things that I see um, and then write about them and try to share them with as many coaches as possible. Cool. Uh, maybe just in a, in a sort of a, an abbreviated version before I start showing people some basketball, like, Brian, what's your philosophy? Like, what is your, how could you, could you kind of like condense your kind of basketball coaching philosophy into, you know, a, a few sentences or, or a, a brief statement? I mean, from the most general, from the most general terms, you know, I just, I'm just here to help players. Um, you know, I mean, that's, that's basically it, you know, like, uh, you know, I never really made it as a player, you know, and so then when I look back and I saw things that, you know, either mistakes that I made or things that I didn't know or things that I did incorrectly, you know, and so those are kind of the things that I latch on to a lot. I suppose, um, and tweet about a lot and write about a lot. Um, <laughs> if you don't follow Brian on Twitter, hi highly recommend it. You know, Brian uh, is a voracious tweeter. He's, he is very active online and has a lot of good things to say. Sometimes critical, maybe often critical of, of taking for granted uh, assumptions about coaching, which is, I really appreciate, but yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I mean, things like, you know, like the growth mindset that you mentioned, you know, when I look back, I definitely had a fixed mindset as a, as a child and as a teen, you know, so, um, you know, when I kind of first came upon uh, Carol Dweck's research, you know, something that, you know, I saw as being important to try to um, introduce to, to parents, especially, um, and coaches and players. Um, you know, as a means to help the players, you know, and same thing, you know, like essentially I didn't make it as a player as far as I would have liked to, because my coach has said I couldn't defend, you know, well enough or I was too slow on defense and stuff like that. And, you know, our coaches, my high school coach and stuff were, you know, very defensive oriented type coaches. So, um, you know, and I had always been, taught certain things on defense. And then when I stopped playing kind of competitively and started playing more, you know, pick up uh, basketball, you know, when I got to college and stuff like that, you know, and, and I ignored everything that I'd been taught, I suddenly became a better defensive player. And so that started me, you know, questioning like the, everything that I'd been taught, you know, as a player. And then, um, you know, and so through that questioning, you know, then I, continue to come up with, you know, ideas or steal different ideas, um, you know, but ultimately, you know, it's, it's all about trying to help players and create a better environment for players. Um, you know, and that's, that's always been my goal, you know, like I'm not really that concerned, you know, I've already, I've already done far more in basketball than I ever could have imagined, you know, like coaching overseas and coaching professional leagues and whatever, like, you know, I never could have uh, imagined even, you know, I mean, I, the first time I ever left the U.S. actually was to go to New Zealand when I was 17 years old. I was an exchange student um, for, for a summer program. Um, I don't even remember the name of the organization that I went with to go there. Um, but so, like, you know, I'd never left the country before that, you know, and and so you know, the next time I left was as an exchange student, you know, after high school, I was an exchange student in Sweden. So, um, you know, before going to New Zealand, like I never really even thought of leaving the country for any reason, you know, let alone having, you know, basketball take me to China and India and, you know, Greece and Estonia. Like, you know, I mean, I don't even think Estonia existed when I was, a, uh, you know, as its right. own country when I was a child, you know, so like these are things I never imagined. So I've done far more with basketball than I ever could have hoped for. So for me, like everything's personally, is just, you know, gravy. Like, cool. so for me, the focus is just helping the players trying to, trying to help them achieve their goals. Cool. Well, I think, um, you know, we're obviously appreciative of, of the time tonight. And, and I think it's good to maybe just jump into some of this stuff now. 
um, you know, knowing the time you've invested over the years into it. I, I'm going to start, you know, for everyone who hasn't maybe seen this, if you've done a level one course with me, you know that I share this video often. Um, but if you haven't, um, you know, this is this is on Brian's website, his YouTube page. And I would actually encourage anyone who's watching this to maybe if you've got like a side screen or, or you can condense your window, you know, it would be a good idea to, to maybe pull up Brian McCormick's um, YouTube page. Um, which is really just Brian McCormick on YouTube. Um, and he's got just a ton of videos in his video library. And one of them is this video. And I think this will kind of, this video will set the tone for the conversation we're going to have about basketball philosophy. Um, and it's, it's pretty short. It's less than two minutes. So I'm just going to show it. And then we'll, uh, we'll talk to Brian about it on the backside. Right. I mean, like, it's beautiful basketball, man. Like, how did you, how did you do that? <laughs> how did you, how did you get a team? Uh, Cause I mean, the way that they just move it is so beautiful. Um, tell us a little bit about what we're seeing here. Um, you know, this was at the Broward, this was your Broward team. Was this two years ago? Uh, was this last year? That was my first year at Broward. Um, because we had, it's all of them in the old jerseys. So there was uh, 2016, 17, I think, mm -hmm. or 17, 18. Yeah. Yeah, 17, 18. So when I just, that was our first year. Talk us through it. Talk us through it, Brian. Like, you know, what are we watching? Um, you know, what, what, what's the philosophy here from a basketball perspective? Uh, well, I mean, a lot of this, you know, you could see, you know, several of the possessions started in the, you know, with the full court press, um, especially some of the early ones. Um, but I mean, a lot of the credit goes to the players because like in the screen that you see right now, all four of the girls that you see from uh, my team are all Swedish. Um, mm -hmm. And actually three of them came from the same club, although mm -hmm. they're far enough apart that I don't think uh, the oldest one played with the youngest one. Um, at any age group. Um, so, you know, that, that was part of it is, is, you know, I, I did a pretty good job recruiting um, and got, got some, got some players who understood how to play basketball uh, and then uh, kind of incorporated all the other players around that, um, you know, and, and, you know, we didn't really have, I mean, for me, the kind of the funny part watching these this video was realizing there's only one possession or maybe two possessions that had our best player on the court, um, you know, during these, like almost every one of them, I think, um, had the girl in the top left um, right now was our other point guard. Um, she's back playing in, in Sweden now. Um, and, you know, our, our, I guess, best player, all region player that year. Um, was only she hit one of the threes in the clip 
Um, but uh, she was our Russian point guard that was a freshman then. Um, but the other thing is you got uh, right now there's three freshmen and one sophomore on that screen. Uh, and then this is, and we're playing this game, we're playing an NAI school, Kaiser. Um, so that was, you know, predominantly juniors and seniors that we're playing against in this one. But, you know, for, for the most part, you know, our goal was, you know, just move the ball and get an open shot, you know, and we had players who I felt were good shooters. Um, you know, that's why I recruited them, uh, you know, but like, again, the, the 21, the girl under the basket, like she shot 30%. Um, from three the year before she came to Broward, the girl on the far left, number 11, Pernilla, um, she was, uh, uh, she, I didn't even find this out until her sophomore season, but I think she's told me she shot 25% from three in high school um, and stuff. So, uh, but when I watched them on tape, I thought they were shooters and I, and I knew that they could become shooters. Um, and so that was our goal. You know, we shot a lot of threes. We weren't that big uh, and we just tried to move the ball. Um, you know, and our basic was, you know, all offense is just around, you know, whatever you're trying to run, it's just about disorganizing the defense, um, and then keeping the defense moving. Once you get the defense in, um, rotations, you know, you don't want to stop the ball and allow them to recover. We just want to keep it moving until we get the shot that we want. Um, and so like against the press break or against the press, you know, that's, that's all we want to think is to me, a press is just transition basketball. Um, mm. and so once we make that first pass over, uh, you know, kind of over the first line of defense, we should have an advantage moving forward. So usually, you know, four on three, depending on the press, but, uh, we usually should be going down four on three and, and there's no reason, you know, we don't break a press to break a press, you know, we break a press to score. Like, again, that's, it's just transition basketball. It's just like we got a defensive rebound and we're trying to beat them down court, mm. uh, to score, you know, we just. We just want to attack and we always want to have that attack kind of mindset. And that's why, I mean, you saw a couple of the early highlights. Emma is still at Barry University. She's from Norway. You know, she's throwing the ball up, you know, with the one handed, you know, 40 foot, you know, pass. But, you know, that's what we're looking for. Just advance the ball, get the ball down court. And then once we get the ball, you know, into the front court or into the scoring zone, you know, then we just want to pick out the shot that we want to take, you know, and for us with, you know, with this time team, excuse me, if we couldn't get, you know, wide open layup, you know, catch and shoot three, you know, was usually going to be our best offense. Um, so, I mean, that, that's the basic idea is, is just keep our spacing, um, keep that attack mindset, you know, and once the defense is disorganized, which, you know, most of these clips, you know, I mean, this, we're talking about the end game. So when these picked up, you know, it was basically the defense was already disorganized in all of these. Um, and so it's just a matter of moving the ball until um, until we found the shot that we want. You know, if I'm a coach and I'm watching this for the first time, you know, devil's advocate is like, hey, look, Brian, you've got some really good players already. You know, you, you know, this is at, at you know, like a high level of basketball player in America or in Europe, you know, like does this apply to younger teams? You know, like, is this, can, can we get, you know, younger players to play this way? Um, you know, what would, what would be your response to that? Because I think it's worth, you know, you've written a book literally on this topic <laughs> um, for, for folks. And can you just sort of like talk maybe about the broader philosophy and why it's not unique to any specific age group or team? It's actually, it's actually built in into um, a, it's built in around some science, which, um, you know, we don't need to get too deep into the science necessarily, but, you know, talk about it as a, as a basketball philosophy and not just a, you know, a, a way of, um, you know, a, a something that's unique to that team um, or that level of play. Yeah. I mean, to a certain extent, I think it's easier with younger players to implement this because the, the hardest thing that I had at the junior college level and to a certain extent, um, here, although it's different here, but at the junior college level, the hardest thing that we had to overcome as coaches was the players um, wanting to run plays, you know, mm -hmm. because that's how they've been coached. Like even those players on the court, you know, uh, two of the four definitely would prefer to run plays. Um, you know, they just felt more comfortable. They had played 
you know, because a lot of the European players had played with adult teams before they came to the States, right? Because they were, you know, 19 years old and they were playing on uh, in Sweden, Basketetten, which is uh, the first division. So in, ba- in Sweden, it's the Dom League and is the quote unquote Pro League and then Basketetten would be the next division down. And so all of those players on the court would have played in Basketetten, um, which is, you know, for some of the clubs, you know, it's, it's a way for the younger players to play against better competition. But for a lot of the clubs, you know, it's an adult league. It's basically what I'm coaching here in Estonia, you know, and so we have a young team that we, that we enter into it, um, you know, predominantly an under 20 team plus like two players or three players. Um, but we play against adults. I mean, we played against a guy who's, you know, 44 years old and had played for the Estonian national team for, you know, a dozen years. So, you know, and everything in between, you know, so, um, so in that situation, their clubs had typically run a lot of plays um, because it's an adult competition. And then high school players, you know, the other half of my team that weren't in a lot of those clips, but were on there, you know, there was, uh, you know, the one girl knocked down a three, Alyssa, and um, TP had a pass out to the corner. You know, they were my, some of my American players that, uh, you know, I'd grown up in high school running a lot of plays. Right. And so, so the difficulty with that age group was getting them out of their comfort zone, which was running a play and trying to get them to actually uh, just play basketball. You know, whereas if you're starting with, you know, like I watch our 13s and 14s here. So, you know, 12 and 13 year olds. And I mean, our club, our our 12 and 13 year olds are really, really good here. Like they're definitely the best in Estonia and probably, you know, our 13s are one of the best, you know, probably in Europe. Like they just went to Barcelona and finished second um, to an all-star team in a, in a tournament in Barcelona. Um, so they're really good. And their coach basically, you know, uses like a dribble drive motion type mm-hmm. offense. So, but so a lot of what they do kind of fits into this same kind of idea. Um, and so I think when, when players are developed, you know, or when coaches start early trying to coach based on these ideas, as opposed to coach based on set plays, um, I think it's actually easier. Um, it's, it's in one way harder, uh, you know, cause the coach has to give up the control, right. You know, and you're relying on players to make decisions. Um, and so there's going to be more mistakes at a youth level. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, compared to if I, you know, come down and say here, you know, you do this, you do this, and I want, you know, best player, you take the shot, you know, like there's probably going to be fewer mistakes doing that. Um, but, uh, did you, you get know, pushed how back? much learning is going on? Did you, get, did you get pushback from the players? Like, were there, was it like, as you went through that first year, you know, of, of really kind of implementing, you know, your approach? Um, which, you know, to me, you know, I know it's funny. We talk about these things as offenses or what have you, but like, this is just good basketball, right? Like if we're being honest, right. this, is, this is good basketball and you're, and you're trying to reduce good basketball to the simplest kind of principles you can, right. To strip away the waste, right. And, and get it back, get it down to its essence. And, but, but, you know, habits, old habits die hard, you know, and, and what are, you know, what kind of pushback did you get from players? You know, how did you deal with that? Um, the biggest pushback was, you know, from the players who didn't fit that kind of, you know, system as well. And so they didn't play as much as they might have played, you know, the previous year. You know what I mean? So, um, you know, that was kind of, I would say, you know, the pushback was was players who just didn't fit that style either because they didn't shoot well or because they wanted to dribble a lot, mm-hmm. you know, or you know, because they wanted to shoot, you know, 15 foot jump shots. So they took away spacing, Mm. Um, you know, they were the ones who, you know, struggled the most with the system, you know, because, you know, I mean, in all honesty, it was a college program and I was coming in one to coach my, the way that I wanted to coach, but also I recruited half the team and I didn't recruit half the team, right? Nice. Half the team, was, yeah. half the team was leftovers Yeah, and didn't fit how I wanted to play. 
Mm. And I was upfront with that from the beginning. And I told them I'd help them transfer if they wanted to make sure that they could go someplace where they would get more playing time. Cause you know, I told them, I was like, look, I'm bringing in eight new players and nine new players. And these are the nine that I anticipate playing the most, um, you know, because I'm the one signing them. So I, I believe that they're good. You know, that's why I'm signing them, you know? And so like, there was one girl in the clip, Spanish shooting guard who looked up the Swedish girl's stats and was like, I'm better a shooter than her. I'm like, all right, if you think so, be my guest. And she wasn't, but, um, you know, so, so that was the, the pushback is, it was, you know, it wasn't so much, well, we don't want to play this way. It was more yeah. like, it just doesn't fit how I've always played mm. and it doesn't fit my skill set as well like i need eight dribbles to get myself open yeah. you know now you're telling me i can't take those or i only want to take you know 17 foot step back jump shots and now you're telling me that those are bad shots yeah. you know um so that was the pushback you know and i even you know so basically you know at junior college you kind of you know i had mo all most of those girls who were on the video i had for the second year mm -hmm. and that was our best season you know because mm -hmm. now they really understood how we wanted to play um, and so it was, we were even better than those clips, uh, the ball moved better and we, we ran better stuff and got everybody involved, et cetera, et cetera, um, shot the ball better. Um, but then the third year, uh, basically moved on everybody to division ones. And so now we had like a whole new team. Mm -hmm. And so then again, it started over. And so there's a lot of pushback from that group, you know, with, uh, you know, um, well, no, I'm used to set plays and I'm used to this. My coach told me this is a good shot for me. And, you know, post players having their trainers come to the gym and tell them, you know, the problem that that, uh, you know, you guys lost that game was because you didn't get the ball enough. And I'm like, dude, you were one of eight and had five turnovers, you know, in 14 minutes. Like, how can you blame the guards for a loss when you're that inefficient? You know, like I'm trying to get you the ball because I'm trying to get you, you know, we changed a little bit because we had more post oriented players that year and I wanted to get them the ball a little bit, you know, so they could get their scholarships as well. You know, so we tried to incorporate the post into some of this type of action. Um, but she was, she was a black hole basically, you know, so we basically play with her for like three minutes and she'd be a black hole and then take her out and then go back to playing, you know, basketball like this. It would be good, Brian, to probably talk a little bit about your four principles, just kind of so people really understand them. Um, you know, maybe you can speak to some of the references with the Broward team or the kids you're working on now in terms of how you, you know, how you think about this. But can you just walk us through these four principles, which I think are like the underpinning kind of kind of like concepts that you're really wanting to to um, get players to learn um, in order to do this well? Sure. Uh... So the first one, disorganize the defense. So, you know, most people think of plays as we're running this play to get this shot, right? Um, you know, we're going to whatever run, you know, the flex so that we can get a layup off the flex cut or we can get the down screen for, you know, an elbow jump shot. You know, and those are the two shots that we want to shoot. You know, whereas to me, you know, whatever you're running, whatever – action you're using or tactical skill that you're using all you're trying to do is disorganize the defense so if i'm running an on ball screen you know it's not so that i can get my point guard driving to the basket to score a layup and if my point guard can't turn the corner and score a layup then we're just going to back it out and now we're going to run something else um, it's we're running an on ball screen and the defense is going to do something right? We're, we're forcing the defense to do something. They're going to hedge. They're going to trap. They're going to go under, uh, you know, however they're going to play that situation. And whatever they do, they should be, if we do it well, they should be disorganized in some way. So somebody has to help a little bit more. Maybe they're tagging the roller on the weak side. You know, maybe they switched and now we've got, you know, mismatches on the, on the guard and the post, you know, however they want to defend it their defense is now disorganized. So essentially we've taken them out of their perfect shell defense, you know, where everybody's, you know, one step up the line, hand in the passing lane, 
you know, or we're in pack line where everybody's, you know, whatever the pack line defense is, you know, and everybody's matched up with the people that their coach told them to guard and all that. Like we've done something, either they're not matched up correctly or they're two steps over further in help than they want to be. Mm. Or, you know, we actually have, have turned the corner. We've got it going towards the basket. We've got the, maybe we, maybe they just chased over the screen, you know, and, and they're playing drop coverage. And so, you know, we've got the defender, you know, on our hip or behind us. And now we're just attacking the drop coverage, you know, whatever it is, we've disorganized the defense. Yeah. And so even if we can't create that layup for the point guard, if we move the ball, we keep that uh, defense disorganized. We never allow them to get back to their neutral kind of defensive shell. And so to make it harder for them to get back to their shell, um, you know, we need to keep good space, you know, and so uh, the offensive spacing, spacing his offense is from Rick Majerus. Uh, but, you know, the idea that, you know, we need to keep, uh, spread out so that we force the defense to guard from sideline to sideline and from, you know, however far out we can shoot 25, 30 feet, you know, to the baseline, you know, I mean, that's why NBA offenses have become so hard to guard because now you're, you're having to guard a Curry or a Trey Young or Dame Lord, you know, you can set a ball screen at almost half court and defenses feel like they have to chase over top, you know, because if they go underneath, you know, they can pull a 40 footer, Mm -hmm. and still hit 33, 34%, you know, on a 40 footer, you know, so now you're chasing over top. So you're basically at that point from the half court line playing transition defense, you know, you've, you've basically beat that one defender, you know, and so you've got a five on four fast break now from half court, you know, and that's really hard to stop. And if you keep good spacing, you know, if you keep the spacing, then however they manage to stop the ball, well, now you've created a two on one somewhere, you know, you've taken the first player out. So it's five on four. So now somebody else has to rotate over to stop the ball, you know, so that next pass. And now we've got, you know, maybe they, maybe they, you know, they help from the right side. They've got, you know, we've got somebody in the 45, we got somebody in the corner, you know, so the 45 defender comes to help on the ball. So we throw it to the 45. So the corner defender does a great job closing out to take that away. But now we've got somebody wide open in the corner, you know, because we just have a man advantage, you know, so that's how the spacing accentuates the offense. Uh, And then the idea of the offensive player is most open when they receive the pass. Um, You know, most traditionally offenses were built on or players were taught, you know, you catch the ball, you triple threat. Once you triple threat, now you have the option to pass, you have the option to shoot, you have the option to drive, you know, you look around, you see who's open, you see where your driving lane is. And that's just not how basketball's played, right? It's too slow because every time I catch the ball and hold it, that defense can recover and they can get back to their shell. And so if I'm going to shoot the ball, I need to shoot it off the catch. That's what I'm, there's a reason why somebody passed me the ball, right? Because I was more open than they were, you know, the you- idea that, Brian, I think you've said it maybe in another place that um, you actually teach players to make the decision while the ball's in the air. Is that, have you? Yeah, that's, that's the goal is, is I should know what I'm going to do on the catch, um, you know, before I catch the ball and then I can always adjust. Right. So if, if I'm standing there, I'm like, Oh, I'm wide open. I'm shooting this. And, you know, I catch the ball and I start to go into my shot and somebody's made an amazing closeout to get to me. Well, I can always decide not to shoot. Right. Right. But if I catch the ball and I'm flat footed and I look and I go, oh, shit, nobody's guarding me. Okay, now I'm going to shoot the ball. Well, one, I'm not in rhythm. Right. And and two, I've given the defense more time to then they do have time to get there and they don't have to sprint at me. Right. Because. Uh, you know, and obviously I talked about, you know, closeouts and, and stuff like that a lot. But if if I'm looking to shoot as soon as I catch the ball, if the defense wants to take that away, they have to run all the way to, you know, they can't do a perfect, mm. you know, run two thirds of the way, choppy step, stutter step, close out, two hands up, because they're never going to get to me in time to take away my shot. Right. So if I'm catching the ball thinking shot and right into my shot to begin with, 
and they want to take that, that away. They've got to be a sprint to my body. Well, now if they're sprinting all the way to my body, well, I've got a driving lane. Mm. I can attack their momentum, mm. which is going to give me a bigger advantage than if I catch the ball, wait, hold it, let them get set and then go, okay, now I'm ready to play. I'm going to jab, step, jab, step, jab, step, go. You know, it's probably worth it's just, And Brian, it's probably worth kind of reminding, like the point is to get the best shot possible. You're not going to get the best shot possible if the ball stops that if you catch right. and pause and read that that has the risk runs the risk of shutting down the advantage and now you have to create a new advantage right and so this is right. like kind of the, quint the, the quintessential piece of of advantage basketball um i will say matt's now here hey matt <laughs> um good to see you and and thanks for throwing some questions in so matt if you can kind of monitor the questions as we go um yep. i will throw kurt's question out there because it's a good time brian so kurt dammers who's um done a lot of his own coaching and has worked with some very good players like um you know around you know we've got um uh I think that there was an interesting question of what is actually a good shot. I know you have a lot to say about um, about the kind of shots you encourage, but there's also certain shots you discourage and it has less to do with the kind of shot and more the situation, right? Like, like in terms of shooting on a bad pass, right? Like don't shoot, right. don't shoot shots that come on, come on bad passes. Um, can you talk a little bit about like how you, you know, what your players learned or what you want players to learn about when to shoot? Sure. Uh, I mean, most of that is individual and also up to the coach, you know, what they determine to be, you know, a good shot. You know, for me, you know, we want to be um, in our range on balance and open, you know. And so, uh, you know, open is going to change for each player, you know. So, you know, one of the players, 21, in those clips, like uh, she shot – I think it was, it was, I think it was her. She shot like over 50% on content on what was considered contested three point shots. Mm. Right. So she feels open, even if a defensive player is within, you know, kind of the three foot or four foot, you know, boundary when they, you know, kind of, you know, whatever stat the game. Right. So she's got a quick release. And so she needs less space to feel open. Mm. Another player might need, whether it's because they're less confident or they have a slower shot or they have a lower release or, you know, whatever, various reasons, they might not feel open unless they have six feet of space mm. or eight feet of space, mm. you know, and so open is going to change for every player. Um, range is obviously going to change for every player, you know, Dame Lillard's range is 40 feet, you know, that's not the same as, you know, your average high school player. Right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, but we want players to shoot shots that are in their range and then on balance, um, you know, I mean, balance tends to be kind of a, um, one you, you, uh, know it when you see it, but it's hard to define kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's the one that I would say, you know, players, Players get, well, players sometimes struggle with open too, you know, because they, they think they're better shooters than they are maybe, or they don't even realize the defensive player is there, you know, and they don't realize that they had to change their shot because of the defense. Um, but uh, until after they shoot it, you know, then they're like, oh, yeah, I, I probably did have to change my shot a little bit. That probably right. does mean that I wasn't open. Yeah. Or like they get their shot blocked. And I'm like, were you open? Yeah. I'm like, how did they block their shot? Yeah. If you blocked your shot, that's pretty much the definition of you not being open. Right. <laughs> um, you know, but, but so balance sometimes, because, you know, some player, you know, you look at, you know, Kobe's fadeaway, right? Is he off balance shooting a fadeaway? Probably not. Right. But mm -hmm. other players can look like they're, you know, standing on two feet under them and there's not a ton of, you know, left to right or front to back movement but they might not even have good balance. I mean, there's players, mm -hmm. I've said this about free throw shooters, they're free throw shooters shooting a standstill self-paced shot who don't have good balance because of the way that they, on a free throw, because yeah. of the way that they bend, right? Because, you know, they get so far up on their toes, you know, when they, when they bend and then they try to squat too far down mm -hmm. and they're literally off balance, throwing the ball at the basket before yeah. they fall forward, right? So, but... But nobody would ever say, 
you know, looking at, well, they missed their free throw because they're off balance. Like they're standing still. Like how can they be off balance? So Brian, you know, I but then you see somebody right. shooting a free throw. Yeah. Oh, what? Go ahead. All right. Sorry. I just think like, um, so people are starting to throw some interesting questions in there. And I, and I think that they're questions about practice design, which we're going to get to next. But I want okay. to um, maybe just close the loop on on these four principles. And if you could just talk about the last one, the dribble is not an end. Sure. I personally found this one of the first things I observed in New Zealand when I came to New Zealand was the number of players who shoot tough twos and and off and, and the number of possessions that had less than three passes in a, in a possession. So effectively, if I when I the first year and a half of being here, I saw basically no one passing the ball and whoever had the ball drove and shot a double clutch off balance contested, you know, paint shot that wasn't open like and, and a lot of that was this function of people driving and deciding that they were going to shoot on the drive. So can you talk about maybe the dribble is not an end, because that's how I interpret it and is, is am I right on there or, or do you is it mean something different. Uh, I mean, it's it's related, but to me, the dribble is not an end means, you know, like, you know, well, first of all, you know, you don't get points for your moves. Like yeah. the purpose of a dribble is to create a shot or a pass, right? Um, otherwise, don't dribble. Um, but also once you start the dribble, you know, you need to keep the dribble until you create that pass or shot. You know, if you, if I just, so what kills, one of the things that kills offenses the most is catching the ball, taking one dribble and picking it up. Yeah. Right. Cause now I'm, in, I'm dead. You know, the defense knows I can't go anywhere. Right. I've taken away that threat. So, uh, you know, so that's, that's one of the things for me, like the dribble's not an end means, you know, I need to use the dribble to create a pass or shot. So I need to go somewhere with the dribble. You know, it's not just a matter of dribbling. It's a matter of like, uh, you know, if I'm attacking, I need to attack, you know, mm -hmm. not just put the ball down straight down and, and, you know, dribble just to dribble, you know, um, I'm either, you know, I catch the ball, maybe my post player is open. So I need to take one dribble, you know, to get a better passing angle into the post. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or I'm using the dribble off and on ball screen, you know, or, you know, I get a closeout, long closeout sprinting at me. So I'm using the dribble to attack that, which is different than I get a long closeout coming at me and I dribble and I wait for the defensive player to get here so that I can make my move so that I can, you know, beat the defensive player. And now I'm, I'm getting the ball and I'm going. And so that's, that's the idea for me is, is it's, you don't just dribble. Like you, you want to have a purpose with, the dribble and that purpose is I want to you know be moving the offense just like a pass can move the offense along mm -hmm. but the dribble can give us ball movement as well um, and so we're using it to move either from a neutral to a small advantage or from a small advantage to the big advantage mm -hmm. um, and so that's you know the shot creation or the or creating the, the pass or creating the uh, passing lane yeah I think so. I think before we talk, move into kind of the practice design questions and all the questions about, um, you know, teaching, shooting and things of that nature, I do think it's worth maybe just spending a little bit more time on the notion of like, like system design and, and like the rules for play, you know, in the sense of like, you know, here we've got four pretty compelling principles. Were, were these the rules for offense or were these kind of the concepts that guided the actual rules themselves for play? Like how deep do you get, you know, with, with the team you're working with now or the Broward team, like what were your rules for offense, you know? Um, you know, I mean, with that team, this was largely it. You know, I mean, we had a couple, um, I mean, this is really it, like this and take good shots, you know, like, um, <laughs> You know, we ran we ran certain actions, uh, you know, as our kind of initial way of disorganizing the defense. Um, but I mean, this was this was mostly in, in terms of rules or or concepts. This was this yeah. was largely it. Like you know, just move the ball and take good shots. And that's what with our team here. That's kind of what we emphasize is we want to play fast, um, play with tempo, um, and then move the ball and take good shots. Yeah. Um, and that, those are our, you know, basic rules and same thing. We have a couple of simple actions that we run, you know, to start to play and disorganize mm -hmm. the defense. 
Um, kind of my ideas of spacing are a little bit different here. Uh, you know, both because when I'm playing with the, in the men's league, you know, especially we're almost always playing two posts together. Mm. Um, although one of them uh, usually is a shooter, so it, it shouldn't reduce our spacing that much. Um, but, uh, you know, they're not, uh, you know, fastest cutters and, and things like that. Mm. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, like, about entries I don't, you, I don't, I, I don't really use a ton of rules and I don't, you know, cause I think when people think of rules, we're thinking of constraints or we're thinking of ways to limit players. Like I don't have anything like, you know, I mean, good point. We're trying, I'm trying to get whoever gets a rebound. I want you to dribble up the ball. Like, you know, I don't want, we don't want need to have one player dribble the ball all the time. Like if you get the rebound, let's go. You know, we don't, I don't really limit. I mean, it's probably why I'm better as a developmental coach than I am, you know, maybe coaching more competitive teams because I'm not, there's nobody on my team. I'm telling don't shoot the ball. Mm. Right. Like if you feel this is a good shot for you, shoot. I'm not taking you out if mm. you miss a shot. Mm. Right. You know, I mean, if you start taking a bunch of fadeaway, off balance, contested shots, then we'll talk, you know, mm. but if you, if you catch the ball and you're open and you shoot it, like, okay. Yeah. Like that's what we're trying to do. Mm. You know, like, um, so yeah. So, I mean, this is, this is basically the principles of the rules by which we played. I, I think that it maybe the notion of rules is also probably an interesting one to think about in terms of, um, you know, um, set plays versus actions in the sense that, you know, you write a lot about actions because they don't have prescribed rules. There's more reads out of a sort of an initial configuration, right? And, um, you know, maybe for the purposes of helping people kind of see through this, I think, you know, you've written about the concept of PlayStation coaching, which you know, the kind of notion of a coach really controlling all the decisions for players on the court. Obviously, we're trying to push back on that, you know, um, fewer, you know, when you do implement structure, it's, it's more just as a, um, as a way of creating disorganization, um, as opposed to a, you know, very kind of prescribed action where you pass here, then you pass here, then you pass here, then you pass here, then we get the shot. It's more of, it might be past year, past year, then you've got these three or four options. Um, and, um, and then out of that, you're going to read and then we're, we're playing, you know, we're playing to, to create the advantage and get the best shot we can out of that situation. Um, and I think that, you know, I've pulled a couple um, clips here for folks. Um, I think I might actually skip over this one um, and actually go into this one because this is kind of a, an illustration of an entry. Um, you know, in the sense of, um, you know, entering the ball into the high post and then playing off it. So I don't know, maybe you can talk to, you know, using this as an example, kind of the notion of entries or actions that sort of disorganize the defense and trigger action. Like, does that make sense as a question? <laughs> sure. Yeah. So I'll just play it and you can talk about it. Okay. Yeah. I mean, so specifically with this one, you know, 52, the tall blonde, you know, getting the ball. So she was, she basically was our defense, um, but teams would uh, not guard her a lot um, if she wasn't, if she didn't have the ball, you know, and, but she was a really good passer and mm -hmm. she was an okay free, you know, she could shoot, you know, out to the three point line and stuff like that. So, um, but she wasn't a great finisher, like setting a ball screen with her and having to roll to the basket. Like she wasn't a great finisher and uh, stuff like that. So teams would double team, uh, you know, our, our point guard a lot uh, and basically dare her to beat us, um, mm -hmm. if you will. And so late in the season, you know, we started using her a lot more as, uh, you know, basically the playmaker if you will so get her the ball and then let's run screens off of her uh, and so you know essentially use our least dangerous offensive player mm. just as a passer mm. um, and use our four most dangerous players as the cutters and screeners uh, and so that's more or less what you're seeing here is the two ways is this one we called five and you know we look for the back cut that you just saw there. 
the other way was just the typical, you know, elbow action. We we're passing it into her and doing a post split, you know, on the strong side. Um, you know, but again, the biggest thing is, you know, like most of these, you know, the, the players are pretty good cutters. Like even the other player that's on the court right there, number one, she'd probably be considered our, you know, the weakest player that you see out there. Um, and, but she's a great cutter. And again, she's a good passer as well. Like she wasn't a great shooter, um, but just a, a really hard cutter, good cutter, a very unselfish player and a great passer, you know, so she would fit into something like this. And even though teams knew that, you know, cause she actually, her first year played for one of the, you know, one of our other league schools. And so, you know, she didn't play for them. So they knew they didn't think she was good, you know, essentially. Right. And so, but putting her in the situation where she's setting screens, cutting to the basket, like um, it made our, our quote unquote better players harder to guard um, because you couldn't, there was nobody that you could really just stand in the key and not guard. Like when we played some, like some of the teams with this team. So this is from my second season there. Um, you know, we would literally not guard players on the other team. Wow. Um, like, like this team, the last clip, their point guard couldn't shoot at all. Right. So we started the game with 52, the tall blonde guarding their point guard and basically just standing in the middle of the key. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we just more or less played, uh, you know, five on four defense. Uh, and just said, okay, if, you know, if you can beat us, then beat us, you know, just shoot threes. We'll see, mm. you know, and when we did a, when we played, you know, a system like this or used actions like this, like they couldn't do that. Right. Even if, even if they thought, you know, the girl wasn't a good shooter, whether it was one or 52, you know, like they had to guard that player because either, you know, 52 had the ball in her hands. And so it's very hard to get, you know, a player not to guard somebody who's standing at the free throw line with the ball, right? Like, you know, it's very hard to convince them, you know, nope, just back off and stand under the basket, like make her come to you. Mm. Like, so she'd get the ball at the free throw line and they would have somebody close to her. And so that opened up everything else for our better players and our better finishers. Um, and so it's just a way of using you know, somebody who was in the game for her defense, 100%, um, had one good offensive skill, which was passing. Um, and we basically just tried to maximize that skill mm -hmm. and then minimize the effect that her lack of shooting or lack of finishing yeah. would have. I think um, probably also it made her too. a very good player. It's also good, probably, yeah. I think, you know, if I were to kind of, you know, put a cap on this piece, it would be to say that what I see as well is that, you know, you've got a team here that understands, you know, movement, passing, cutting. And uh, in, you know, what we saw in the first video was a team that wants to get out and run. If you can get out and transition, get a layup, we don't need to set it up. But we also are able to, ex you know, run actions in the half court that are tailored to our team that suit the player's skills. So I'm not going to run the exact same set on every single team I have. I'm going right. to find sets that work for this team. And those sets are going to give players freedom to make reads, but it's going to have enough structure to capitalize on our strengths and minimize our weaknesses, you know? And so, cause we see a lot of coaches, you know, rehashing the same sets from team to team to team. And it's like, actually you need to mix up your sets because teams, you have a different team every year, you know, and, right. um, and you need to be able to, to, to meet their strengths. And so you're going to create your advantage differently with each team and maybe within the season differently because you're going to learn new things about your players, you know? Yeah. Cool. Uh, Matt, do you want to maybe throw some questions in there from the, from the group? Yeah. I mean, what, do you, what do you think? Yeah, sounds good. Lots of really good stuff in there, Brian. So um, appreciate that. Got quite a few questions. Vince, are we going to get into, should I leave the kind of implementation practice question? We're literally we'll going to go into, into training next. So the okay. process of so designing training. Yeah. Okay. Let me ask a couple of these questions from Alex. There's another really good one from Josiah, but mm. maybe we'll leave that one towards the end. But um, Brian, could you go into your um, 
a little bit more detail around the importance of age appropriate hoops, balls, maybe other equipment um, to develop good habits, especially shooting? Sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's probably one of the biggest things that I'm, you know, most adamant about. You know, I just think that, uh, you know, most of what we do, especially in terms of shooting at the high school level and beyond, is to fix mistakes uh, that children, uh, I should say, fix mistakes, you know, in quotes, um, that children have developed as habits because they've played with balls that are too big for their hands or on baskets that are uh, too high for them, for their strength level, you know? And so they've adopted uh, solutions to that problem, um, but those solutions are not the same as the ones that, uh, you know, we would use, you know, or that an adult shooter would use. And so you spend all your time with a high school player trying to, uh, get them to move beyond this habit that they've developed um, and trying to adopt, you know, a, a more adult type technique. Uh, and so I think the easier solution is instead of spending all our time with high school players trying to change these habits is just don't let the habits, you know, form in the first place, yeah. you know, so start, start players with, you know, and everybody wants to blame the three point line. Aha, you know, it's, these kids these days, they just want to shoot three pointers. It's like, well, yeah, it's fun. Like the problem's not the three point line. The problem is that they're shooting on a 10 foot hoop with a, you know, a men's basketball or size seven basketball. Like that's the problem, you know, put it, give them a eight foot hoop with, you know, a size, you know, four or size five basketball. And now the three point line is well within their range, you know, um, with something that resembles, you know, adult technique, you know, it's, it's, they're more able to shoot a one-handed, uh, you know, shot because the ball isn't too big for their one hand, you know, they're able to shoot for, you know, further out because the ball isn't too heavy, you know, and the basket isn't too high for them to reach. Um, so, yeah. So, I mean, I, I just think that that's the biggest change that, you know, we need is, is we're in such a rush to get to the adult game um, that, you know, a lot of players get left behind when they get to the adult game or get to a more competitive level because they, they don't have the correct habits. And if they just take in more time, you know, at a younger age, uh, you know, and, and worked with more age appropriate equipment, they'd be better off, you know, when they get to that stage, when they're, you know, once they mature, once they hit their growth spurt, et cetera, et cetera. Like I watched, you know, I think it was last Monday, I watched our under 11 girls team and under 11 here plays on a 10 foot hoop. Um, and I watched them practice and they can't shoot for more than six feet, you know, from the basket, mm -hmm. you know, cause they're, our, our boys program is much further along than our girls program and our girls program, the under 11s, most of them are, one, they're fairly small, but two, they're um, almost all beginners, right? Um, we only have maybe one or two players that has experience. Mm. So, you know, whereas our, our under 11 boys team, you know, everybody's been playing for two or three years. Yeah. Um, it's something that our new chairman's trying to change and we're trying to improve the girls program, you know, by starting with younger ages, but, you know, you can only move so fast. So, um, so I'm watching them play and I, I texted, you know, my boss, the, the guy who's in charge of all of the youth program. I'm like, why are these girls playing on a 10 foot hoop? Yeah. He's like, well, you know, division one at under 11s, they play on a, that's what they play on. Yeah. And so I talked to the coach afterwards. I'm like, look, I understand your games are on 10 foot hoops. I was like, but none of these girls can shoot. I was like, you'd be better off practicing on an eight and a half foot hoop and then just playing your games on a 10 foot hoop. You know, but you're not going to be able to teach things like spacing, shot selection, shooting, you know, even passing when nobody can play out. Nobody can make a shot outside of six feet. Like, how do you teach spacing? You know, why, why would a defensive player go guard a girl at the three point line when they know that they can't make a shot outside the key? You know, so now how do you teach defense if the best defense is to not go near the player and just stand under the basket. Right. 
Um, so I think that, I think there are other reasons beyond just shooting why having that smaller basket, um, you know, or lower hoop and, and smaller basketball, you know, is important because, you know, I mean, you know, what do we all complain about? Ah, well, everybody plays zone. Well, why are they playing zone? Ah, because nobody can shoot. Well, why can't they shoot? Because they're playing on a 10 foot hoop <laughs> and the ball is too big for them. Right. So the answer isn't, ah, let's make sure that nobody plays zone defense. No, the answer is let's make it so that they can make shots because ultimately that's why players sign up for basketball because shooting is the thing that brings people to basketball. And like coaches want to be like, ah, you know, no, we need to hustle more and take some charges. And that's not why kids play basketball. Like kids play to score. Right. Why does everybody watch the NBA? to see basket score. They want to see Curry make a three while he's looking in his stance. They want to see somebody dunk. Like this is what basketball is. Basketball is not your defensive rotations and getting the ball in the low block and taking seven dribbles and making a hook shot. Like Mm -hmm. nobody cares about that stuff. Right. And, you know, some of it may or may not be important, you know, in terms of long of success, but ultimately kids play basketball, score the basketball and to shoot. And so to make it more fun, find ways to make it easier for children to score the basketball. And along with that, it will help them develop better habits. And along with that, it will allow them to play a more realistic game of basketball. It will take care of many of the other things that we spend much more time worrying about, like zone defenses, right? If we would spend as much energy complaining about basket height as we do complaining about teams playing zone defense, yeah. we could probably get rid of both problems. Interestingly, you know, we, could, we think, could solve the zone defense problem. Yeah, I think um, one of the good things for us is that we don't we're you're, we don't have zone defense in the junior grades, so below below 15s. So we don't we don't see the zone defense problem. However, we do see the pro- a lot of the other problems, and um, we do see the problem of kids not really learning how to play basketball until they're strong enough to shoot shots outside the key. And so, you know, you really don't, you know, if the, the, the quality of basketball you see in, in kids below the age of, of, you know, in primary school effectively is, is really poor, if I'm being honest. And it's something we have not addressed systematically in New Zealand at all. Like we have not at all addressed the issue of how we actually design quality development. And no, no one's really invested in quality development, you know, so far in those grades, you know, like in that sense. In that sense. Um, I think it's an interesting segue though, because you know, it raises important questions about how you learn to shoot. And I think that that it's a good segue to questions around practice design and the importance um, of, of teaching players how to make decisions and how to develop skill in against live defense. And I think if there's any one sort of like the, the kind of great connector here um, between these things is this idea that like you've, you're not gonna develop players who can read the game um, you know, and we think about all the reads you've articulated already, you know, the decision to shoot or, or, or drive the decision um, when you're in the paint of, of what to do, um, the decision decisions around um, holding the ball versus keeping it moving. Like those are all decisions that require perceptual skill, the ability to read defense and make decisions in the moment. And you just you're not going to be able to really do that without without defense and training. And so I think it's an important segue to like, you know, how you design training for this. And I know there's been a question here of, I think it's maybe a good one. What, what's, the first, what's the first drill you use in order to embed one or more of your principles? Um, and also, I mean, maybe we'll just start there and then I can start walking us through some of the shooting um, and small sided games that we have to show people. Um, I don't think you have it up there uh, on any of the slides, but probably the first drill is, um, I, you know, I call it four on four Canada rules or, All right. you know, Mike McKay's drill, yeah. um, you know, and, you know, so the basic idea, if you haven't seen it, you know, there's, uh, I set out cones, you know, that separate, you know, the half court into six boxes, you know, and you've got four on four and you can't have two people from the offense in the same box at the same time. Um, and then, uh, you know, unless they're going for an offensive, unless they're going to, for an offensive rebound, um, you know, and if you get an offensive rebound, then you just have to spread out, you know, as quickly as possible. But so the basic, so that's basically what I use to teach 
the basic spacing, right? So, you know, if I want to, if I'm in the center box, you know, above the top of the key and I have somebody on the, you know, right wing um, and I want to drive to my right, well, that player has to move. You know, they can't just stand there because I'll be dribbling into the same box. Mm. So that person has to make a decision. Do they, you know, are they going to flare down to the corner box? Well, what if somebody's standing in the corner box? They need to flare down to the corner. That means the person in the corner needs to cut through. Mm. All right. And so basically it, it just develops the, the, the basic spacing. Like, I mean, I'll be in games and I'll say, look, just think about the boxes. You know, mm. I call it candid rules. Players generally will just call it the boxes game. Mm. So you know, I just think about the boxes. Okay. Like we've got, basically we've got four of you all in, in these top two boxes. Like we just have to, you know, spread out, use the whole court. Um, you know, if somebody comes at you, like, where should you move? You know, just think about when we play boxes, right. Stuff like that. So, um, you know, if I'm, if I would give, you know, the first, first uh, drill that I use to implement any of the principles, that'd be the first thing that comes to mind. Um, I've got a couple here as well. Maybe you can just kind of talk about your practice design philosophy as we go through these kind of in the same way we did before. And I might throw some questions out there. Um, but this one is, um, this is a three on three game. It looks like, and maybe you can just explain the rules of the game as it's articulated to the players in training and then why you've picked this one. Like, what is it that you like about this game? Because this is hockey rules. This is your hockey rules three on three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, so uh Basically, uh, the only real rule is, well, the two rules are you stay on the court until you get scored against. Um, so um, I don't even know if you can tell, but basically there's two white teams and two dark teams. And so there's four teams total um, and uh, of three people. Uh, and so, you know, the white team will stay on the court until uh, they get scored on. Um, when they get scored on, the team that's on the baseline will inbound and replace them, right? Um, and then the other rule is you have to dribble the ball across the half court line. So what we're trying to do is get uh, the defense, or I'm trying to encourage them to trap and look for uh, backcourt steals. Um, and so we don't want, so like there's a turnover there because he threw it across the half court line, right? And so that's why we're inbounding on the side. That, um, and so the, uh, it's partially a defense. I mean, th these are drills that I've been using going back to when I was uh, coaching under nine AAU in Los Angeles, California, mm. um, hoop masters. And, you know, mm. everything was based on every team pressed, you know? Mm. And so, so, you know, you had to be able to be to press and you had to be able to press. Right. And so, you know, that was one of the games, you know, that we would use, you know, and so, so we still use it. We look. So Brian, it sounds like it sounds like what you're doing there is you're saying, OK, we're going to come up against guards who are good ball handlers who can dribble across half court. We want to teach our defense on the one hand to create that pressure to be able to recover and prevent dribbles across half court. But at the same time, it's going to teach offensive players to be confident um, you know, in terms of head up, reading the court and using, you know, reversal passes um, to lag players, right? Like um, as, as well. Yeah, honestly, it's even simpler than that. Okay. <laughs> like, honestly, when, when we started playing this game, it was how can we create a game that's going to lead to a lot of layups? Right. Because under nine basketball is all about making layups, uh, right? So, creating traps in the backcourt and not allowing them just to chuck the ball down court. Yeah. It's either going to lead to the defense stealing the ball, going right in for a layup or the offense making, you know, one pass out. And now it's a two on one fast break going, going the other way, which yeah. is going to lead to a layup. So that's largely what it is now for us. The reason why we did it here is because, you know, as a club, when we talked about our philosophy at the beginning of the year, we wanted to play fast and we want to have backcourt pressure. Cool. So we leave it up to players, but we play full court man defense and they always have the option. If, if you dribble towards the sideline, mm -hmm. you can trap from behind. If they dribble at you, then we're going to run and jump so that, you know, and cut off the dribble because um, we should be at help anyway. 
and not allow them to split us if they go towards the middle. So we just run and jump, um, or what we call a jump switch, but run and jump. So, so think, that's why we're working on it here. What we'll do is kind of as we go through these, Brian, we'll maybe rapid fire these ones a little bit just to kind okay. of like, kind of get your thinking um, behind the, the drills design or the games design. I don't like using the word drills. I like I prefer to use the word games. Um, but you know, maybe talk us through again, like same kind of thing. What's the rules? What's the rotations? What's the purpose? Um, yeah, this looks like a two on two, uh, a weak side two on two yeah. game, shooting game, I think, right? Yeah, so this is just, I think our biggest weakness is passing. Um, so, but this is just, a, you know, this was one of our uh, Monday workouts where we're just basically, this is a shooting drill for us. Um, and so, but the passer has to read which, um, which player is open. So the defensive player that's starting, um, you know, on the left side is supposed to take away one pass or the other. And so the offensive player just has to, with the ball has to read, uh, you know, where they should make that pass. And then on the catch, we've got to decide, you know, are we catching and shooting or are we catching and making that next pass, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and they have the freedom if they're not open off that second pass, um, if they're not open, then it's, uh, you know, dribble into a shot um, because it's, like I said, this is a shooting drill. So I don't want them just backing out and playing two on two at that point. So it's, uh, you know, first person's open for a shot. If not pass it, second person's open for a shot. If the defense plays a great defense, mm. uh, then attack that close out and shoot. Mm. Cool. That's cool. Next one is a similar but different game. You've got an advantage at the top, and this is a three on three game. Yeah, so now, yeah, so this is moving on to making it a live three-on-three -three type situation. And now this one we're going to play out. Um, and then I think when we are playing this one, like this team, this is my under-16 team, um, and their previous coach was all five out, five out, five out, and everybody just stands around the perimeter. Mm -hmm. So we're really trying to get them, uh, or I'm trying to get them to cut more. So that's part of the reason for the mistakes is we're not just standing out there um, outside the three-point line is I'm trying to get them to read when they should cut mm -hmm. and when they should stay. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, actually this must not, this isn't entirely my 15 team because there's at least, or 16 team, there's at least one under 15 player there. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, yeah, so I mean, that that's the goal is, is it's the same idea okay is we want to put, we're attacking somebody should be helping to stop the ball um so from a defensive standpoint we're working on uh uh whether we should uh if we're guarding the ball whether we got beat and then we need to peel off um and our we're, somebody else is going to rotate over and help and we're going to peel off or can i get back in front and guard it myself and so that's what we're working for from a defensive standpoint. Offensively, we're looking, uh, you know, to make the right decision with the ball, find the open player uh, and play from that situation. But also with with the idea that we're trying to get a little bit more movement and cutting and not just stand behind the three point line and shoot. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, I think before I get to this, I just I think it might be worth maybe asking you about shell drill <laughs> um, and and just how you like, you know, your philosophy on that, because again, it's like you're teaching offense and defense at the same time. So you're not doing a, you, you know, like you don't do a traditional shell drill um, where where the you know offense is standing and the defense is simply like rotating into these like predefined positions. Um, can you just talk about why you teach defense through live play versus, you know, doing those kind of static static drills? um yeah i just well one i've never used a four on four shell because i just don't think uh i think the rotations all change once you put a fifth player on the court mm. um spacing from from an offensive standpoint changes and and depending on how they uh you know align themselves that's going to change all of your rotations so to me four on four just isn't applicable um from a from a teaching rotations standpoint um and then in terms of five and five, like I just, you know, I mean, offense isn't static, you know, like the problem with defense is not guarding stationary players that are going to catch and hold the ball, 
right? And so I get the idea, well, we have to, you know, force them to run so that they know that they're supposed to run from, you know, the key out to the three-point line to guard somebody and they have to, you know, run to help and all that, whatever, you know, but the easier way to, to teach that is to have them get beat if they don't run, you know, like if they're going to walk out on a closeout and somebody hits a three, well, that's going to start to teach them that they need to stop walking out on a closeout and mm -hmm. run out and get a hand up and close out to the shooter. Like, you know, I just don't, I just don't see the purpose of, of a shell drill. Like I, I just don't think um, that it's that applicable or that transferable. And I, I think that again, you know, the only thing it's applicable to is guarding bad offense. Right. And I don't care about guarding bad offense because that's easy. Mm -hmm. Right. Good offenses are going to have movement and they're going to be doing something to disorganize the defense. And so we have to be able to play defense once we're disorganized or we have to be able to take away what the offense is doing to disorganize us. And so, you know, generally that's going to be screens, you know, cutting maybe. Um, but those are the things we have to guard. So we just guard them. Right. We, mm -hmm. You know, we don't worry about, you know, being in the proper position because the proper position is always going to change and fluctuate based on where the ball is mm -hmm. and based on who's moving um, and stuff like that. Um, and so I just, I think people get used to playing the static offense mm -hmm. and then they get in the game and the offense isn't static, right? And, and you have to be moving at all times you know and if you're running a shell drill where you sprint okay hold the ball wait okay everybody's in the right position no okay you move two inches this way you move two inches this way okay now make the next pass all right yep everybody's closed nope you need to be here you should have two feet in the key not one foot in the key mm -hmm. you need to have your right hand you know this high instead of this high like you don't stand still that much on defense you know and especially you know when in FIBA when you're playing a 24 second shot clock, like you're moving that whole possession, you know, against a good defensive team. Again, like you're on defense, you're moving that whole possession, mm -hmm. you know? So I think that's how you, it should be taught, you know? And so we just build out, you know, if we want to work on individual defense, we play one-on-one. -on -one. If we want to work on closeouts, we play one-on-one -on -one with the closeout. You know, if we want to play, work on help defense, you know, we're playing two on two or three on three, maybe four on four, you know, and we're encouraging dribble penetration, you know? And if, if we're working on ball screens, we're usually starting two on two and then we're going to play maybe three on three and then we're going to play five on five, mm. you know? And so, um, you know, we're just trying to put players in the situations that they're going to face in games and, you know, just play those. I think it's, um, so I think it's, uh, as we kind of near the end here and I know people are hung with us pretty, pretty well, this is, we still got, you know, most everybody still here. Um, I think it's worth kind of talking about shooting specifically because it's a point of interest for our country um, and definitely for Harvard, for us. Um, and I'll just kind of very briefly read this quote because I think it speaks to the, your philosophy on shooting. And, and obviously I think, you know, folks should get out there and get the evolution of 180 shooter, which is an update. I, I remember buying the original. Um, and so, um, you know, it, there's some, there's some ca counterintuitive wisdom here around the development of shooting. Um, that, that I think is really important. Um, so, you know, this is from a blog, you know, as I write this, we're second nationally in three-point field goals, fifth and three-point field goal percentage, 12th and free throw percentage. Yes, I target players who I believe are shooters, but in several cases, it appears I saw them as shooters before they did. I do not instruct a lot on shooting technique. We shoot a lot during practice, although we rarely shoot free throws and we value shooting. We do not have a Dr. Dish in our gym shooting machine. Players shoot together and rebound for each other. The biggest factor in the development, in their development, I believe, is comfort and confidence. They know they can shoot and will not be punished. I challenge them to shoot from further out. I yell at them to shoot as soon as they cross the volleyball line. I take out players for not shooting open shots rather than taking out players for missing shots. We have a culture of shooting, I suppose, and a culture from the type of practice to the extra shots to the comfort and confidence is how we develop 40% three-point shooters. Um, yeah, like I've got some clips here and, and, you know, I think maybe you can just sort of you know, give us, you know, your, your philosophy a little bit there around like, why don't you teach technique? Like, why don't you spend any time on technique? And maybe this is a little bit for the trainers out there, because I know we've got a lot of trainers out there who are also wanting to spend time on with players on shooting. You know, we've got coaches who might have a player who's 
you know, got some flaws in their technique. When do you, when is there a time, is there a time to work on technique um, or, or, and what would be the ap approach to dealing with that? Um, and, and maybe just, again, kind of articulate your, your teaching philosophy or coaching philosophy around shooting um, and improving shooting. Okay, so um, first I would say uh, evolution of 180 shooters, 100% um, rewritten. Um, it's not just a update. It's it's basically, you know, one 180 shooter was written back, kind of when I did more, you know, individual training, you know, and it was and it really came out of what I did with a player when I was at UC Santa Cruz, my first college coaching job. Um, and then further on with a couple other players. Um, and then evolution is kind of everything that I've done like the last five to 10 years. Um, and so it's, it's completely different. I would say uh, 180 shooter is more, like I said, what I did when I was training players individually, evolution of 180 shooter is more what I do as a team coach, I guess. Right. Okay. Uh, and so, uh, in terms of technique, you know, in some ways I do work on technique. I just don't talk about it, if you will. Mm -hmm. So like I'm working with a boy right now, uh, he's on the under 15 team. He's a, you know, post player, um, ish type player right now. Uh, and so like, you know, last week or whatever, we were, we were practicing and, you know, we were shooting our shots and then towards the end, you know, I was like, just, you know, I just want you to think about two things, you know, just shooting quicker, you know, and shooting the ball a little bit higher, you know, because every time, you know, I, I get him shooting quicker, he starts to have rhythm. When he slows down is when he, when he loses his rhythm and he, he starts to have more of a two motion shot. And so then he's like, well, my dad was telling me that I need to have my elbow at 90 degrees and I need to, and I'm like, look, I'm like, he's not wrong. Like, that's what, that's what, you know, people teach. I'm like, but the reason why he's teaching you this is because when you typically, if you have your, you know, elbow at a more acute angle and he shoots from pretty high on his head because he's, you know, always been tall and he's a post player. So he shoots up high. So if you have a more acute angle here, it's more likely that you're just going to come straight forward. Right. And, and basically just use your elbow as a fulcrum. And now you're going to have a flat shot. Whereas if you have your elbow at 90, you know, maybe, you know, with that vertical forearm, it's easier for you to shoot up. I was like, but truthfully, the angle of your elbow doesn't matter. It's, you just need to think about shooting it up. And that's why I'm continually telling you shoot the ball higher because you need to make sure that the first motion that your hand or the ball goes through is to go up and not just to go out to the basket. Right. And so that's where, you know, I've used things like shoot out of a telephone booth. You know, it's kind of the metaphor that I use, uh, you know, or shoot out of a um, um, convertible. Right. So I need to get the ball up then out. Right. And so to me, that's that's what I'm doing. You know, his dad wanted him to worry about his elbow ankle and stuff like this. And other people are telling him that he needs to turn his feet a certain way, whatever. Like, but to me, none of that is that important. Like, because when I pick up a basketball, you know, my mind does not go to, well, is my, ang is my arm at 90 degrees, right? Like, and if I am thinking, well, is my arm at 90 degrees, I'm thinking about the wrong thing, right? I don't want to have internal cues as I'm going into my shot. I want to think about making the shot, yeah. right? Or maybe, like I said, I, I try to get him to think about shooting it quicker, right? Um, you know, so there's one thing that he can latch onto, and it's kind of the... Um, the whole shot as opposed to, you know, cause I mean, he could shoot with his elbow at 90 degrees, but if he still has a two motion shot or if he's still off balance or whatever, it's not going to matter. Right. Ultimately everything needs to sync together. Um, and so I think a lot of times when we, um, we focus on technique too much, we end up focusing on um, like, I guess the symptoms and not like the actual cure, you know, and we're, we focus so much on where the elbow is, um, and oftentimes the problem with the elbow is derived from the feet, you know, mm -hmm. and it's just a matter of, it's the body's way of trying to generate more force. Mm. Okay. Well, if we, if, if that force generation is 
then causing the ball to go in a direction that we don't want it to go, then we need to create force some other way, right? Um, or we've got the elbow slightly out and the ball is always going straight, then why do we care if the elbow's out? Right. You know what I mean? Right. Like if the ball is going straight, then clearly the problem that we think we have isn't the problem. It's the same thing to me with like thumbing the ball, you know, mm. with your left hand. I don't really care. Mm. If the ball is going straight every time, who cares if you thumb the ball? Right. right. You know, like I thumb the ball when I shoot and I can stand at the free throw line and make 80 to 90 percent of my shots right now. Right. Mm. Thumbing the basketball with my left hand. Right. So it's not really affecting my shot. Mm. Right. And if it's not affecting my shot, why would I worry about it? Why would I put a thought into a player's head that creates doubt, that gives them a reason to think about something other than making the shot as they're shooting mm -hmm. if it's not affecting the shot? And so that's my first question when I work with a player is always, you know, what do you shoot from the free throw line last year? What do you shoot from the three-point line, right? Mm -hmm. And the first problem is most players don't know. And at a youth level, somewhat understandable, you know, the, you might not even keep stats like, you know, I mean, we keep, we get stats for our, uh, you know, under 18 games, but we don't get stats for our under 16 games, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I'm coaching, I mean, I've already coached 40 games this season, so I'm not going back and statting every game that mm -hmm. we play, especially because half the games we win by 40 points, right? I'm not going to go back and watch that just so that I can have stats to see what players are shooting. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, so, you know, there are reasons why youth players, but to me, if you're, if you're a high school, if you're a college player, you don't know what you shot last season. That's your first reason why you're not a good shooter, right? Mm -hmm. You're just not invested. You know, if, if I'm a, if I'm a college player, it's not that hard for me to look at my stats online and see that I shot 50% or 60% or 70%, you know, mm -hmm. like I'm not asking for a exact percentage. I'm asking like roughly, like, are, are you 80%? Mm -hmm. Are you 60%? Are you worse? Right. Cause if you're an 80%, free throw shooter, then I'm not really worrying about mm -hmm. your technique issues. You know, if you're, if you're an 80% free throw shooter and a 20% three point shooter, well, it's probably something to do with strength or coordination as you move further from the basket. Yeah. It's not because you thumb the ball, right? Mm -hmm. It's, there's something wrong moving back. If you're a 40% three point shooter, well, I'm not going to try to change your shot. You're like, you're there. Like I, I remember talking to a dad in Detroit at a clinic and he's like, yeah, my daughter shot 40% from the three point line this year, but we really need to change a shot to get it up higher. I'm like, why in the world would you change mm. a 40 plus percent three point shooter shot? Mm. I was like, if she shoots it from instead of shooting it in, in front of you know, her chin, if she shoots it from the top of her head, yeah. that maybe enables her to get off one more three pointer maybe every once every three to four games. Right. Right. So now maybe she gets to shoot 10 more three pointers a season. Right. But you're going to risk her moving. You know, if things go wrong, yeah, you could take a 40% three point shooter and make her a 33, you know, is it worth it to make, to take? So we're talking about four makes now, yeah. if she keeps the same percentage, right. Four additional makes per season. Yeah. And you're risking potentially making her a bad shooter, you know, by now she's thinking about where she needs to shoot, or maybe she doesn't have enough practice time to completely change her shot, whatever the case may be. Right. But why would you take that risk? Right. Um, Brian, so those think, are the kind um, of the reasons why I don't talk about technique much. Yeah. I think it's, um, there's a couple of, Matt, do you want to share some of the questions that are coming through? I think there's, there, there's some yeah. quick ones and then we can finish with some of the drills that you do. Yeah. Yeah, you know, we might finish with uh, two questions here. We'll we'll stay on the theme of shooting. From um, DC's got a question around um, your culture of shooting for your high school or college age athletes. Um, how many reps are you targeting uh, per week for each athlete to be shooting? Um, and do you have a target percentage uh, that you're trying to have them make in practice? Um, no, I I don't care what they shoot in practice. I care what they shoot in games. So I don't, I don't target because I mean, if, if my target was 80%, I can guarantee you that I can manipulate drills to make sure that they make 80% of their shots in practice, right? Like 
you know, um, it's just not important to me. Like we, we shoot a lot in practice um, and we try to take as many shots as possible in game situations. Um, you know, we play a couple of competitive games, um, you know, that kind of can gauge whether or not they're reaching, you know, like, you know, if we do a drill called eight minute shooting and if the, if they don't get 25 threes, um, as a group, then I know that they either shot poorly or they didn't go very hard. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so there's things like that, that I can measure on my own. Um, but I don't worry about practice percentages. Mm -hmm. I just worry about what they do in games. Do you, in terms of a target, in terms of maybe volume, do you have a target per week for an athlete of that age? No, I mean, I, there's, I've, I've never had enough assistance that we could track how many shots players are shooting in practice time. You know, it's just, you know, I mean, like I said, we just do, I mean, most of our shots come, come through kind of, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, three on three, five on five situations. You know, and then we'll do one or two shooting drills mm -hmm. on top of that. Um, but I don't have any type of exact goal or number that I'm trying to hit. Yeah, it's, fair to, it's fair to say, Brian, that you focus on quality of shot over quantity in the sense that a shot, you know, you'll you'll you want to get as many reps in game situations as possible, um, as opposed to reps sort of in the abstract. Like you, you're not you're yes. not. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Uh, just the last one for me. This is I, I like this question from Josiah. Um, he says you've written about coaching, uh, questioning ourselves as coaches about developing players with the idea of preparing them for the game's demands or changes in the next ten plus years. So, what are some of the trends you're seeing happening that you are preparing players for? Your insight on kind of where you see the game, game going in that period. Um. I mean, I, th I think it ebbs and flows. And so I think, you know, and it also depends on what rule changes are implemented, but, um, you know, there will be something will happen to try to reduce the influence of a three point shot, mm -hmm. um, at least in, at least in terms of the NBA. Right. Um, and that could either be going far the other way, which would be, um, you know, adding the four point line, which some people are in favor of. Um, and so that would put, you know, even more emphasis on shooting uh, from distance um, or rule changes that ultimately try to de-emphasize de three point shooting and emphasize whatever post play or shooting closer to the basket, you know, so that could be pushing the three point line further back, you know, something like that. Um, I just feel like that, you know, the more as NBA teams move closer to taking almost, you know, half their shots from the three point line, yeah. I think enough fans are, are becoming disgruntled with, you know, everybody playing the exact same way and yeah. stuff like that and analytics is ruining basketball and stuff like that. So um, not necessarily things that I agree with those hot takes, but um, I think that could create changes. So, you know, it basically shooting further from the basket then becomes more value either because the three point line gets moved further back. And so you have to have more range on your shot or because there's a four point line em em implemented. And so that increases the value of, of range on your shot. Um, you know, I kind of think, one of those two will, will potentially happen. Um, you know, I think, you know, a lot also depends on how, you know, how fouls are called. Like I know yeah. for us, like, I was gonna say. Um, you know, offensive players here, you know, when you go to the basket, you can basically push off, you know, you can keep one hand on the ball and one hand basically Heismaning your, uh, defensive player and so it becomes very hard uh to defend a drop right and so um you know i spent more time talking about shooting less here and attacking the basket more because it's so hard to to stop people attacking the basket mm. right um and so what does that you know how does that change like 
do we get to that point in the U.S. where like uh, um, players are allowed to, you know, be more physical with the drive and push off more to create space and contact for finishes, which then emphasizes, uh, you know, attacking and, and increases the offensive efficiency of getting to the rim, you know, or, you know, in Europe, do they start calling more fouls when you, um, or in FIBA, I should say, you know, where, when you attack the basket. And so instead of, you know, my team, you know, shooting eight or 10 free throws a game, despite, you know, attacking and playing at a pretty high pace, you know, we're more like, the, you know, college basketball in the U S where you're shooting, you know, 30 to 40 free throws a game, you know, because they, they don't allow that kind of contact um, when players are shooting around the basket, you know? So I think those are some of the, the potential changes that, you know, either will emphasize uh, attacking more or attack or emphasize the shooting even more. Um, but I think as defenses, as players get bigger and stronger and faster, I think just the, it becomes even more of a player's game because the players can take away so much of the sophistication um, and it, and you have to rely on players making good decisions continually. Um, and so I think that's, you know, when I look at what I'm doing to develop players for the future, that to me is the biggest one is being able to play faster, um, not just in terms of running speed, but, but decision-making, you know, like yeah. being able to make that shot pass decision quicker, you know, being able to make that, you know, cut or stay decision quicker, you know, reading that cut stay decision better, you know, mm. um, you know, cause I think, I think those, I don't think that'll ever change. I don't think we'll ever go back to a slower game, uh, mm. you know, with more reliance on set plays and, mm. and ISO basketball. I think, I think even ISO basketball is basically there to, to create the long closeouts that force, that help other players that aren't the best player get better shots, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think we're ever going to go back to, you know, just feeding the ball to a single player so they can ISO and there's no double teams coming and no help and they can just back down and take the shot that they want. Mm. Mm, that's really good. Yeah. I mean, I think we could, we could keep going. Um, I think we're probably, we're probably at the limit. I think we'll probably stop there, Brian. I know I have some other videos on there, but I think it'll just, we'll just end up going longer. I, I would just encourage people to, to go to the website, um, the YouTube channel and, and have a look at that, you know, read the book, pick up the books, read the books. Um, you know, Brian's got a lot of stuff. Most, almost all of your books are on Amazon. Um, yeah. and, um, you know, I can't thank you enough for this, for this time. I think it's really, it's really cool to see how your thinking has evolved over the years. Um, it's no surprise at all, um, you know, how deep the thing your thinking is in terms of, you know, you know, you've clearly thought about, you know, basketball and player development and coaching, you know, in, in extremely, extremely, you know, deep, thoughtful, insightful ways. So, you know, it's had a huge effect on, effect on me and, and it's affecting definitely the way that I run our club. So I want to thank you for that. Um, this has been, this has been great. Matt? Yeah, no, really appreciate your time. Sorry, I was a little bit late. Um, but um, yeah, no, just echoing Vince's thoughts. It's um, it's fantastic. I'm probably not, you know, I, I have a few coaching friends that are much more on the bandwagon. So <laughs> I probably need to, I probably need to get a few of your books and do a little bit more research. But um, yeah, just want to say appreciate your time and um, looking forward to delving into it a little bit more deeper. Awesome. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me, guys. Always thank you everyone yeah thanks for uh, everyone for jumping on and um you know for hanging with us this has been the, our, our longest one um and for good reason um lots of lots of good stuff in here lots of important interesting thoughts here uh we will post the the final clip on youtube um and uh yeah reach out if you have any questions um follow brian on twitter and uh have a good night thank you thanks guys Awesome. Good. Yeah, we're just getting people, just a few more. Um, Thanks, Brian. 
Oh yeah, no problem. Thank you. Didn't get you up too early. Was it an? Is it, I just googled the time. Eight a.m. start for you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it was fine. It was a. Uh, 